In a church service one Sunday, the offering plate came to a little girl at the end of a row. She took the plate, she put it down on the floor and stood in it. When the usher asked her what she was doing, she responded, in Sunday school, I learned I was supposed to give myself to God. We see that very admonition in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Here Paul talks about presenting yourself to God as a living sacrifice. That idea comes from the practice of offering a sacrifice in the temple. And in our day and time, it would be very similar to what we do when we pass the offering plate. When we pass the offering plate today in the church, we expect that genuine believers in Jesus Christ are going to joyfully honor God with their tithes and offerings as a way of saying that everything we have belongs to God. But what Paul is saying here is that in light of all God has done for us, our response should really be to put ourselves in the offering plate. We are to offer ourselves completely to him in every area of our lives. And this is nothing but our reasonable service to him. Years ago, William Booth walked among the poor, hungry, sick, and lonely people of London, England. The people were crammed into crumbling buildings that were full of rats. They had no jobs. There was no one to help them. And worst of all, there was no one to tell them about the love of Jesus Christ. They did not know that Jesus had died to be their Savior and lives again to be their Lord. So Booth told his wife, I have given myself to work for God among these six souls. And the work that began that day has become known as the Salvation Army. Years later, when someone asked General Booth of the secret of his success, he said, God has had all there was of me to have. From the day I got the poor of London on my heart and a vision of what Jesus Christ could do for them, I made up my mind that God would have all there is of William Booth. And God has all the adoration of my heart, all the power of my will, and all the influence of my life. Folks, listen, there is a big difference between involvement and commitment. A wise old saint's, saint once said, when you look at a plate of ham and eggs, you know the chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. The mercies of God don't inspire involvement, they inspire commitment. Amen? And this morning we're going to talk about commitments. But before we get to that, let's back up for just a moment and remember where we have been in our study of Romans. In the first three chapters, Paul makes the case that everyone in the world is a sinner and stands guilty before a holy God. Then in the next two chapters, he declares that God has offered salvation to all who will put their faith and trust in Christ alone for eternal life. In chapters 6 through 8, he deals with the issues of sanctification and glorification. And then there are those three chapters, 9 through 11, that answer the question, what about the Jew, God's chosen people? Will God keep his promises to them? And what we need to recognize is that chapters 9 through 11 are a parenthesis. So as we begin chapter 12, we're right back where we left off at the end of chapter 8. And so the message is, in light of our justification through faith in Jesus Christ, and the fact that he now wants to conform us into the image of his son, and he wants to sanctify us so that what we have become in Christ, 
matches our outward behavior, in practical terms now, what does that look like? And this is what Paul is going to be dealing with from this point to the end of the chapter. He is now moving from doctrine to practice. And that is the pattern, by the way, of most of Paul's letters. He gives the truth of biblical doctrine, and then he moves into what that looks like in real life. So if we have, in fact, been justified as a once-for-all pardon by God in response to our faith in Jesus Christ, and now God wants to sanctify us and conform us to the image of Christ, then we need to know what that looks like in actual practice. And this is what Paul is giving us here. We're moving from doctrine to practice, from theology to action. And Paul is going to say, here is what your new life in Christ is supposed to look like. And by the way, there are a lot of people who would like to just skip over the doctrine altogether and go straight to application. And I hear people say things like, Pastor, I'm tired of doctrine. Can't we just get to something more practical for everyday living? But we must understand something. It is critical that we begin with doctrine before moving to application. You can't apply what you don't understand. You first must understand the principles of God's wisdom before then you can apply those principles to your life. And any church that is not grounded in the truth of biblical doctrine always ends up following every fad or every whim or every extreme that comes down the pike and will ultimately lack the stability and the consistency to be effective for God. So we have to know the doctrine first, but we then need to go to the application. But that's why we have spent a year and a half in the book of Romans. We must understand the doctrine first. We must be grounded in the principles of God's word. But we can't stop there. We also need to understand how these things apply to our lives. We can't just stop with Bible knowledge. If we don't apply that knowledge to our lives, it does us absolutely no good. My friend, listen, you can know everything, every doctrine that the Bible teaches, but if you are not applying that to your daily life, it is absolutely no good for you to know that. In fact, it can actually be harmful to you because the Bible says it can cause you to become puffed up with pride. Oh, I know all these Bible truths. So we need to go on now to the practical section of this letter. And we need to see how all this doctrine that we've already seen should be worked out in everyday living. The word therefore in chapter 12 verse 1 is the hinge that connects the doctrinal half to the practical half. And what Paul is saying in chapters 12 through 16 is in light of what you now believe, the gospel, this is how you should live. This is what it should look like. And what we will see is that much of this section is in the imperative form. In other words, these are commands. In most of the issues that Paul is going to deal with in these last few chapters, he's going to say, just do it. Just do it. Long before Michael Jordan was hawking sneakers that cost more than bicycles, God was saying, just do it. Before there ever was a Nike company in Seattle, indeed long before there ever was a Seattle, God's word was saying, just do it. And from the time that Paul wrote these words, God was saying, here is my will for you. You don't have to pray about this. You don't have to contemplate it. You don't have to meditate on it. Just do it. 
John MacArthur gives this story in his commentary on Romans. He says, some years ago, a tearful and obviously distraught young woman approached me at a conference where I was speaking. She told me a story I have heard many times. I just can't seem to live the Christian life the way I should, she said. I'm frustrated. I don't have spiritual victory or a sense of accomplishment. I struggle with the simplest forms of obedience, and I'm constantly defeated. Can you help me? I said, what has been your approach to solving the problems yourself? She replied, well, I've tried everything. I've attended churches where they speak in tongues, have healings, and have all kinds of extraordinary spiritual experiences. I've spoken in tongues myself, had ecstatic experiences, been prophesied over, and experienced several supposed miracles. I've been slain in the Spirit. But despite all that, I'm not pleased with my life, and I know God isn't pleased. I've tried to get everything from him that I can, but I'm not satisfied. I'm still miserable and want more. Well, Dr. MacArthur told her, I think you have just put your finger on the problem. The key to spiritual victory and true happiness is not in trying to get all we can from God, but in giving all we are and have to him. That is the key to the Christian life. And countless people every day, including many genuine Christians, flock to various churches, seminars, and conferences in search of personal benefits they hope to receive from God. But the truth of the matter is, they're doing the exact opposite of what Paul says we're to do in Romans 12, 1 and 2. In this forceful but compassionate exhortation, the Apostle Paul does not focus on what we are to receive from God, but on what we're to give to God. And the truth of the matter is that the key to a productive and satisfying Christian life is not in getting more from Him, from God. It is in giving our all to Him. The Bible makes it clear. We have everything we need to live the Christian life. Ephesians 1.3 says, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It says that we have all the treasures of His wisdom and knowledge, and that in Him we have been made complete. 2 Peter 1.3 says that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. The key is not that we need more from God. The key is that we need to give ourselves fully to God. And the secret is not in obtaining more than we have. We have everything we need. It is in yielding ourselves completely to him. And so with that in mind, let's move into these first two verses of this chapter. And they are two of the most powerful verses in all the word of God. Here, Paul gives us four steps that are required if we are going to live the transformed life. The first step is a submission of our soul, a submission of our soul. Look with me at verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Stop right there. The key word that I want you to notice here is the word brethren. You see, this command is one that is given only to those who have already submitted their souls to God. They have already been born again into the family of God through saving faith in Jesus Christ. And the basis of the appeal here is that those who have first experienced the mercy of God shown toward them in salvation are the ones who are going to be willing 
to offer themselves as living sacrifices to God. Having experienced the mercies of God through justification is the first necessary step. You can't go any further until you take that step first. You can't go on to sanctification if you've not first experienced justification. And because he has no saving relationship with God, the Bible says the natural man or the lost man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Only those who are born again through faith in Christ can present themselves as living sacrifices to God. Because they are the only ones that have true spiritual life. Now, another way to say this is to say that only those who are genuine believers are really, in fact, priests who can come before God with an acceptable sacrifice. You know, earlier in this letter, Paul had made it clear that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's chapter 8, verse 8. And no matter what his personal feelings might be, the unredeemed person cannot truly worship God and cannot make an acceptable offering to God and cannot really please God in any kind of offering. Why? Because he has no spiritual life. He's still dead in his trespasses and sins. Therefore, there is nothing that he can really offer up to God that will be acceptable in his sight. So what we're saying here is that you cannot go any further in this passage if you're not born again. This is where it starts. And if you're here this morning and, and you're reading Romans 12, 1 and 2 about uh, being a a living sacrifice to God, don't even worry about that. Don't even consider that. But first begin by submitting your heart to Jesus Christ and receiving him as Lord and Savior and receive his free gift of eternal life by putting your faith and trust in Christ alone. But now once you've done that, once you are born again through faith in Christ, God then wants you to go to the next step. And that's what we're going to spend our time on this morning. Interestingly, the word urge or beseech there in verse 1 really means to call someone up higher. So Paul is saying, come on up higher to, to God's higher standards. Don't be content to stay where you are. If you're a believer, you're maybe a brand new believer, don't stay where you are. Come up higher. Don't be content with just going to first base. Go to second base. In other words, uh, go on with your sanctification to become like Christ. But there's another step here as well, which is the submission of your body. Not only the submission of your soul, and surrender to Christ in salvation, but also submission of your body. Look at verse 1 again. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, the, the term present there was used by the priests in the offering of sacrifices on the altar. It carries the general idea of yielding or giving up. This is in the imperative form, so this is a command here. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It is a command for believers. It's in the aorist tense, which means it's a once for all action. It's a decisive action on the part of the believer. And yet we are to cons consider ourselves a continuous living sacrifice offered up to God. But what is the problem with living sacrifices? They tend to want to crawl off the, the altar, don't they? And that's the challenge. But 
Notice what it is that we're to present here. Our bodies, our bodies. Why our bodies? Well, first of all, we're talking about those who have already committed their souls to Christ. And because our souls belong to God through justification, he already has our inner man, but he also wants our outer man in which our inner man dwells. Our bodies are certainly our physical aspect, our physical makeup, but they're more than just physical shells that our uh, souls, are, that house our souls. They're also where the old unredeemed humanness resides. In fact, our humanness is part of our bodies, whereas our souls are not. Our bodies incorporate our humanness, our humanness incorporates our flesh, and our flesh incorporates our sin, as Romans 6 and 7 clearly lays out. Our bodies, therefore, encompass not only our physical being, but also the evil longings, uh, sometimes, of our mind, will, and emotions. In other words, the redeemed soul must reside in a body of flesh that is still bent towards sin, a place that can readily give in to unholy thoughts and longings. And it is that powerful force within our mortal bodies that tempts and lures us to do evil. And when our bodies succumb to the impulses of the fleshly mind, they can again become instruments of unrighteousness, Paul says. And that's why he said, I continually buffet my body and I make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself could become disqualified. I continually beat my body into submission. So here's the bottom line. The presented body becomes the key to the victorious Christian life. It is because our bodies are yet unredeemed that they must be continually being yielded to Christ. That's exactly why Paul admonished in Romans 6.12, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. Now, it is possible for us as believers to live on one of three different levels. We can live lives that are sensual, soulish, or spiritual. One of those three levels. To live on the sensual level simply means that we're being ruled by our senses. It does not necessarily mean that we are indulging in what we would consider the worst forms of carnality. It may just mean that we're unwilling to go to the evening worship service because we want to stay home and watch TV, or we're unwilling to give our tithes and offerings because we want to spend it on ourselves, etc., etc. It just means we're being ruled by our senses and the decisions that we make are governed by what makes us feel good. We're being governed by our feelings. And for some, their entire Christian life is one continual search for one emotional experience after another. But listen, that is not what makes you a spiritual Christian. You might be moved to tears at the thought of Korean orphans. And you may empty your wallet when the missions offering is taken. But think about it. Even a lost person can do that. Having certain feelings is not what makes you a spiritual Christian. But there's a second level that we can also live on, and that's the soulish level. And here we're ruled by our intellect or will. This is a far more subtle trap. A life lived on this level can appear so close to true spirituality that we can be easily fooled. For example, you can get so 
focused on the intellectual aspects of the Christian life that you virtually become a walking Bible encyclopedia. You've studied the Bible to the point where you have become a great theologian and other people look to you for Bible knowledge. But did you know that you can have tremendous Bible knowledge and still not be spiritual? Or perhaps you are a believer with an iron will. As soon as you got saved, you immediately gave up smoking and drinking. You are exerting your will to the point where you are so disciplined that everyone observing you thinks that you have it all together. But my friend, you can have all the discipline in the world and still not be a spiritual Christian. Or even worse, perhaps you're a combination of all these things. And you have great emotional zeal, tremendous Bible knowledge, and a strong will. And most people think you're an outstanding Christian, but that still doesn't mean You are a spiritual Christian. All these things are important, of course. But being a spiritual Christian means that the Holy Spirit has complete control of your life. It means that I not only have knowledge of spiritual things, but that I'm obeying the Lord in all aspects of my life. It means that I not only feel strongly about the things of the Lord, but I'm also committed to his truth and the conviction of his Holy Spirit. It means I'm not only doing the right things, but I'm doing the right things with the right motives. Now, Paul says that our presenting of our bodies as living sacrifices is our spiritual service of worship. The word spiritual there can also mean reasonable. In other words, this kind of submission is reasonable in light of all the glorious mercies of God toward us. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were present far too small Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. The only acceptable worship under the new covenant is the offering of oneself to God. And from the very beginning, God's first and most important requirement for acceptable worship has always been a faithful and obedient heart. I mean, just think about what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. Or Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Or 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? You and I cannot prevent the remnants of sin from persisting in our mortal bodies, but we are able to, with God's power to keep that sin from ruling in our bodies. And since we're given a new spirit indwelt nature through Christ, sin cannot reign in our souls and it should not reign in our body. Folks, listen, true worship does not consist of elaborate, impressive prayers It does not consist of intricate liturgy or stained glass windows or lighted candles or flowing robes or incense or classical sacred music. It does not require great talent, skill, or leadership ability. 
The only spiritual service of worship that honors and pleases God is the sincere, loving, thoughtful, heartfelt devotion and praise of his children. Well, we must move on to a third step, which is the submission of your minds. Not only your soul and your body, but also your mind. Look at verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here we have a negative and a positive. Both are in the Greek present tense, which means that they are to be continual throughout our lifetimes. This will be a constant part of the process of sanctification until the day we're glorified. And both of these verbs are also in the passive voice, which means something else outside of us is at work here. In the case of not being conformed to this world, that means don't let this world squeeze you into its molds. That's the negative. Don't let the world conform you to its worldview and way of thinking. And folks, the truth of the matter is that many of us are in fact conformed to this world, even though we are redeemed children of God. We often allow this world's values and opinions and fashions to shape us into something that looks like everybody else. We adopt the world's music and the world's form of entertainment and the world's political correctness. And too many of us, if we are honest, would have to look at our agendas and our checkbooks and our moral standards and admit that we have, in fact, to a certain degree, been conformed to the ways of this world. But Paul says, don't do that. Don't be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. Transformed. How do we do that? By the renewing of our minds. And folks, there is only one way to renew our minds into the mind of Christ, and that is with the Word of God. You renew your mind when you feed on God's Word. You renew your mind when you come to Bible study and worship faithfully. You renew your mind when you read the Bible every single day. You renew your mind when you hide God's word in your hearts. The word for transformed is an interesting word. It comes from the word where we get our word metamorphosis. It is the same word that is used to describe a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly. It means to to make such a radical change that the former self cannot even be distinguished. That's how radically transformed we're to become. As one author put it, the transformed and renewed mind is the mind saturated with and controlled by the Word of God. It is the mind that spends as little time as possible with the necessary things of earthly living and as much time as possible with the things of God. It is the mind that is set on things above and not on the things of the earth, Colossians 3.2. And only the mind that is being constantly renewed by God's Spirit, working through God's Word, is pleasing to God. Only such a mind is able to make our lives a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is our spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, there's one last thing that we must be submitted, that must be submitted submitted to God, and that is the submission of your will. The submission of your will. Look at the last part of verse 2. That you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. This simply means that we are allowing the Holy Spirit of God to conform our wills to the will of God. 
The Greek construction makes the phrase that you may prove a purpose or result phrase. That means when a believer's mind is transformed, his thinking ability, his moral reasoning, and spiritual understanding are able to properly assess everything and to accept only that which conforms to the will of God. It carries the idea of discerning what the will of God is and then lining up our lives to match it. Our wills should desire only what God desires and all that is revealed to us, of course, in his word. So what Paul is saying here is that a transformed mind produces a transformed will. God changes our want-tos, and that enables us to put ourselves in the offering plates. What about you this morning? Where do you stand with the Lord? Are you constantly being yielded up to the Lord as a living sacrifice? Are you constantly being transformed by the renewing of your minds? Are you... Uh, submitted in every aspect of life to the Lordship of Christ. That's Paul's message. And this begins the practical section. This is where it has to start. First, you have to be born again. And then you need to go on to that higher level. And Paul calls us to come up higher to God's standard. Will we do that? Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning you would help us Help us, first of all, if if there are any today who have not yet come to that place of putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, Lord, I pray that they would come to do that today and that they would uh, understand that's where it must begin. They must be justified, first of all. And yet they can be justified through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Lord, we pray that that would happen. But Lord, beyond that, we pray for believers that we would all be submitted to you in every aspect of life, that we would be living sacrifices, that we would not crawl off the altar, but that we would stay submitted to you. Our hearts would yield in every way. And Lord, we pray that as we do, that you would receive much glory and honor. So, Lord, we know this is the key to the Christian life, not what we get from you, but what we submit to you. And, Lord, we pray this morning you would help us to respond as you would want us to, according to your word. And, Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, we'll have some men, some elders here at the front at the end of the service, and we want to encourage you to come and talk to one of them if you need to receive Christ. Uh, They will be here. They will help you with that, uh, first of all. And then uh, maybe as a believer, there's something you need to do in response. Perhaps you need to uh, recommit your service to the Lord and just re-consecrate your heart to Him and uh, make yourself available to Him. Uh, Perhaps today you've trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, but you've not taken that step of baptism, a believer's baptism. You need to do that. Uh, as well. And then uh, maybe beyond that, uh, there's some other area of your life. Maybe it's a specific area that you need to deal with this morning, something that's going on in your life and you need a word of counsel or a word of prayer this morning. We want to encourage you to do that. And uh, so you can do that when we dismiss in just a moment.